Good morning. This hearing on the Subcommittee on Readiness and Management of our U.S. Military will come to order. The Subcommittee meets today for the first time since the passage of the John S. McCain National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year of 2019 to receive the testimony on the current readiness of the United States Air Force. Um, I do want to begin by noting a um, <clears throat> obvious significant loss to the country, to the Senate. Um, I'm the new chairman of this subcommittee. I wasn't a chairman before we lost Senator McCain. I would much rather not be a chairman than to have him still be here. But uh, we all know that that was a huge loss for everybody around the table, everybody in the Senate. As a matter of fact, Senate, Senator McCain once sat in this seat from 1995 to 1997, as well as Senator Inhofe, who is now the chairman of the committee. So uh, I think it's just something we should all recognize and be cognizant of. I am particularly pleased that we have um, my ranking member, who is a good friend of mine, Senator Kane, and uh, a great panel this morning. Um, in terms of the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Secretary Heather Wilson, the, Secre the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Chief of Staff uh, Goldfein, and Mr. John Pendleton, uh, the Director of Defense Capabilities and Management for the Government Accountability Office. I want uh, to welcome our witnesses. It has been almost six months since this committee received testimony from the Air Force on its current posture in support of the FY19 budget, as I mentioned prior to that, in those six months, a lot has happened. The NDAA, NDAA was passed with $716 billion in authorized funding and didn't get a lot of press, but 87 U.S. Senators voted for that bill. Very, very bipartisan effort to rebuild our military. The same amount has also been appropriated. The Air Force has now released its The Air Force We Need plan, and I want to thank the Secretary. I've read that for laying that out uh, with the need to ramp up from your perspective, Madam Secretary, to 386 squadrons, as well as uh, conduct internal operational safety and review. And the GAO has released a number of new reports citing the need for instances of needed change inside the U.S. Air Force. So there is plenty to talk about today, and I want to thank all of my colleagues for being here. With the announcement earlier this year of a document that I think most of us find uh, very persuasive, Secretary Mattis's National Defense Strategy, uh, which laid out a new strategic approach to addressing military challenges this committee has a new lens through which to ensure that the lines of effort in this NDS are focused and supported by the Congress. I certainly support, uh, support Secretary Mattis's efforts in this document, the National Defense Strategy, and appreciate that the topics we discuss here are framed in how they support the NDS, especially in how we address potential peer and near-peer conflicts with China and Russia. With Congress passing its first on-time authorization for the first time in over 20 years in an appropriations bill for the military for the first time since 2008, it sends a timely message to both our adversaries and allies that a bipartisan group of senators and members of the House are focused on rebuilding our military in a way that doesn't do damage but actually helps them. It also sends an important message to the men and women in uniform that we are here to deliver bipartisan support for them. The Air Force of today looks in some respects very much like the Air Force of yesterday, and that's not a compliment. For instance, the average Air Force aircraft is 28 years old, and since Desert Storm, we have 58% fewer combat-coded fighter squadrons. While this is not a modernization hearing, it is a readiness hearing. And unless we modernize our Air Force for the future, we will put lives at risk both on the ground and in the air in terms of readiness. With modernization also comes a significant burden on sustainment. So the Air Force must 
find balance between keeping our existing aircraft battle-worthy and ramping up to new uh, squadron requirements that the Secretary laid out in her recent speech. In a recent GAO study, it was found that the B-52, C-17, E-8C, F-16, and, all, and the F-22 all face unexpected replacement of parts and repairs, delays in depot maintenance, and diminished manufacturing, manufacturing sources. Additionally, in October 2017, GAO found F-35 aircraft availability is well below service expectations. GAO has recommended that the Department of Defense revise F-35 sustainment plans to ensure that they include the key requirements and decision points needed to fully implement the F-35 sustainment strategy. The GAO also re re released another report on the need for the Air Force to improve its F-22 organization, which could lead to improved aircraft availability and pilot training. The GAO found in July 2018 that the Air Force's organization of its small F-22 fleet has not maximized aircraft availability and their utilization F of F-22s reduces opportunities for pilots to train for their key missions in high threat environments. Mr. Pendleton, I appreciate you walking us through these findings and recommendations as Alaska is home to two very critical F-22 squadrons. As my colleagues know, as my colleagues know, I do like to talk about my state. That won't diminish as the chair of this committee. I like to mention that Alaska constitutes three pillars of America's military might. We are the cornerstone of missile defense, the radars and the missiles that protect the whole country. We are a key platform for expeditionary forces because of our strategic airlift and strategic location that can fight tonight pretty much anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. And we are the hub of air combat power in the Arctic and the Asia Pacific. With F-35s coming, Alaska in the next couple years will have over 100 fifth generation combat coded fighters, which I'm pretty sure no place on earth will have that kind of firepower and punch. Secretary Wilson, I know you've been a proponent of our small 60,000 square foot mile J Park facility. That's airspace, it's larger than Florida. So I look forward to getting your thoughts on the J Park 2020, 2025 plan and more broadly, how we are going to make sure we have range spaces all over the country and the world for fifth gen fighter aircraft. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here. I'm very much looking forward to being the chairman of this committee. Um, I would like to now turn it over to Senator Kane for any opening remarks. And I'm also honored to have the chairman of the Full Armed Services Committee here as well. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our witnesses. I'm looking forward to this uh, hearing today. I will echo what Senator Sullivan said about just first big committee meeting since the passage of Senator McCain. Um, I, 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 I luckily inherited the office that Senator McCain had for about 20 years um, when he decided to move around the corner into the office that had been occupied by Senator Kerry when Senator Kerry became Secretary of State. My seniority was so low that I should not have been able to get John McCain's office. However, he didn't believe in painting an office, um, and he also was a pack rat, so his office didn't have a lot of curb appeal. Um, so, so I was able to get it despite low seniority and paint it, and I, I, I love being able to be in this office that he had for so long, and I can like sometimes feel like I'm hearing, you know, like the ghost of cur cursing me out, which he did on occasion. Um, we all, so, so we we, all know think, what that's like. Yeah, we can all remember that. The, those words, but uh, I, I'm glad, uh, Dan, that you opened off with that. I look forward to working with you. I had a great relationship with uh, our current chair when he was chair of the Readiness Committee, Senator Inhofe. I think he will attest that I was generally reliable, um, and I look forward to working with you, Senator Sullivan, as well. And you get congratulations not just for being chair, but I think you've joined the committee and become chair in one jump, which is in the subcommittee, so that's pretty cool. Um, Very cool. I don't know that that's <laughs> I don't know that that's ever happened that you join the subcommittee become chair in one jump. So congratulations to that. A couple of issues that I uh, would hope to hear about, and I'll just say um, I, I just want to alert. I'm introducing a Virginia nominee for a district court judgeship position at ten in the Judiciary Committee. So I will leave 
a couple of minutes before 10 and then come back and have questions for you. But the issues that I'm, uh, two that I'm most interested in are, are first, uh, just readiness recovery. We've had testimony in the past about shortage in pilots and maintainers. And I think that what we're going to hear is that you made some real headway uh, in addressing those shortages, and I'm interested in that. I think in particular in Virginia, as I'm at, at um, Langley and talking to our Air Force, I hear a lot more about the maintainer side shortage in a way than the pilot side shortage, and I think sometimes that doesn't get the same attention that pilot shortages do, so I'm interested in hearing how we're, how we're uh, trending there. We have a low unemployment rate. We have a lot of civilian uh, aviation competitors who really want great maintainers and great pilots. And so I know that as you're trying to fill gaps, uh, we're helping on the budget side. We're helping giving you some more certainty. But it is a competitive environment. I'm interested in that. And then second, um, our, the, the state of our installations, our, our infrastructure, is an important part of readiness. Um, the Air Force is facing about $300 million in military cost construction overruns <laughs> or other shortfalls. How does that affect what we need to do on the installation side? I have uh, found that steel tariffs uh, have increased military construction prices significantly in some instances by about 30 percent in terms of the use of steel on Milcon projects. Um, and, you know, look, we will continue to have robust debates about climate change, but climate change is having an effect on installations. The Air Force recently had to cancel an FY18 Milcon project related to F-35 at Isleson Air Force Base due to the thawing of permafrost. Um, we see significant effects at the Langley Base in Richmond, I'm sorry, at the Langley Base in Hampton uh, dealing with sea level rise um, that is affecting that base. It's also affecting uh, other bases in Virginia. And so how are we going to deal with that challenge as we're trying to make investments in Milcon is something I'm interested in as well. But I look forward, Mr. Chair, to working with you on the committee. we got great witnesses here, and we'll have a good hearing. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Inhoff is the chairman. I'd like to yeah, give the uh, floor Mr. to you. Chairman, I only want to make a comment. First of all, uh, Senator Kane, you were always attentive uh, during the times that we uh, had that relationship, and I appreciate um, all of your activity. Um, I was reminded just a few minutes ago, and that's why I was a little bit late coming in here by the Heritage Foundation talking about some of the recommendations that they're making. And we're all very aware that what we went through during the eight years, the Obama years, he did not have a, a high priority in our military. A lot of things that we thought were being done or the public thought were being done uh, were not being done. And so we are, we are in a catch-up mode. We're going to continue to do it. I've had numerous conversations with our witnesses uh, about this, and I look forward to that. However, I also will be chairing the 10 o'clock meeting next door. So, Mr. Chairman, go after it. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and lastly, I do want to make just one note, and, and it's something Senator Inhofe and I have discussed a lot. And, of course, our members are all allowed to ask questions, but just I just want to make a comment on the Space Force. I commend President Trump for thinking about space in a more assertive and organized way, um, but I think the Witnesses won't be surprised. What I've been saying about this idea is that first, and it is appropriate for this committee, we must focus on the readiness of the existing military services, which I think everybody recognizes has plummeted over the last several years, so that they are fully ready to do what the president and the American people expect of them. And while I understand that the desire to talk about the Space Force today might be pressing. I believe that the chairman of the full committee uh, intends to address this topic uh, as a kind of a full committee issue as well at some point. So again, I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, your prepared statements will be entered into the record, and we uh, respectfully request that you keep your opening remarks in the vicinity of five minutes. Secretary Wilson, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll just summarize my opening remarks from my written statement. America is building a more lethal and ready Air Force, and the predictable and increased funding levels that came from the United States Congress have helped tremendously in helping move us in that direction, and I wanted to personally thank you for your leadership and your support of restoring the, the funding for national security and giving us some certainty. The national defense strategy recognizes that we are in a more competitive and dangerous international security environment than we have experienced in decades. 
So the restoration of the force, the restoration of the readiness of the force to win any fight, any time, has to be job one for all of us. So what does that mean and what has the Air Force been doing? Last spring, we gathered together 50 airmen from around the world and, and seconded them away in a basement room in the Pentagon for almost six weeks to, to drill into the readiness challenges that we face. How do we measure readiness? How do we resource readiness? How can we recover readiness more quickly and give us a plan to be able to, to, uh, to implement? The elements of readiness recovery are really fourfold. The first is people. Our end strength is now up to 685,000 because of the resources that you have given us. In 2016, the Air Force was 4,000 maintainers short. Today, we are 400 maintainers short, and by December, in the active duty service, we will be back to having closed the gap, and we will no longer have a 4,000 maintainer shortage on active duty. Now, that means we have to season our young airmen and get them to be craftsmen at their work, but at least now we have enough people there to do the maintenance that needs to be done. Second, with respect to air crew, we have a national shortage of air crew, and it affects the United States Air Force because we are so good at training people how to fly, and the airlines know it. We are focused on retention and improving the quality of service and quality of life, but we are also focused on increasing pilot production. In fiscal year 17, the United States Air Force trained 1,160 pilots. By, uh, in FY19, we will train a little over 1,300, moving by FY22 to about 1,500 pilots, and we will stay at steady state at 1,500 thereafter. If we're able to do that and achieve our objectives on retention, we will recover the pilot shortage by 2023, where we will be 95% manned. We are also trying to scrub all of our requirements for air crew so that we are not overproducing air crew and we have what we really think we need. Third is training. If we're preparing for the high-end fight, we need to be able to provide time and places for our airmen to train in realistic situations. That means ranges, but it also means what we call virtual and constructive training. Sometimes now you can do more in simulation than you can do actually up in the air. That training has to be relevant and realistic. And Mr. Chairman, you're right. Jay Park, as well as our NALIS test and training range, are two of the premier ranges in the world for being able to train for the high-end fight. The fourth thing we need to do is cost-effective maintenance and logistics. We have an old fleet with high operating tempo for the service. And this, in, I think this is going to take the most intense focus on recovery of readiness is how are we going to make sure that our aircraft are ready to go and ready to fight tonight. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the final thing I would mention on things that we're doing and things that you funded that helped was the restoration of munition stockpiles where we were depleting our munition stockpiles in the fight against ISIS faster than we were replacing them and the funds that you provided have allowed us to significantly recover from that situation. So we are doing these things to recover readiness. We are simultaneously trying to field tomorrow's Air Force faster and smarter. We set a goal for ourselves six, six months ago. We have a very good leadership team in acquisition. And they got together and said, you know, in the first 12 months together as a team, they wanted to strip 100 years out of our acquisition programs, 100 years. So far, they have stripped out 56 years out of our acquisition programs. Um, we are using prototyping. We are changing the way we're doing software development to do that faster and better. And we are committed to transparency and accountability. We've seen just over the last few weeks that competition works. We have, we have uh, saved about $13 billion just on three major acquisition programs that we've announced over the last few weeks, the TX, the replacement for the UH-1 helicopter and the GPS satellite program have all, because of competition, come in, come in at lower than our cost projections. The Air Force is more ready for major combat operations today than we were two years ago. More than 75% of our pacing force is combat ready today in their lead force packages. That said, we all know we have a long way to go, and we're after it. Chief? 
Thanks, Thank you, Madam Secretary Sec Wilson. General Golfing. Thanks, Madam Secretary and Chairman. Thank you for holding a real timely hearing. What I'd like to do very quickly is just share a story that perhaps offer, will offer us perspective on what we're here to talk about today. Of all the work and the obligations that we have, and I would say this is a shared obligation between this committee and the Secretary and I, the one that, uh, that I believe is nothing short of a moral obligation is to ensure that every airman, soldier, sailor, marine that we send into harm's way to do the nation's business is properly organized, trained, equipped, and led. And when they get back, they can come back to their families that we've taken care of while they're gone. Everything else we do the best we can. So let me just share with you uh, one quick story about uh, what I call confidence under fire, which is what we're here to talk about. How do we produce the readiness of the force to accomplish that moral obligation we have to those that we send into harm's way? I was a young captain when we went into, into Desert Storm, and I know that there are many here that uh, have also, uh, Senator Sullivan, yourself, uh, Senator Ernst, have had combat time. And you know that, that warrior's prayer hasn't changed over the years. You know, please God, don't let me let my buddies down and let me get the job done. And so when we went into Desert Storm, uh, I was in a squadron that had uh, all but one, none of us that had combat time. The squadron commander had had combat time in Vietnam, the rest of us had never seen it. And so we went in uttering that prayer and we crossed into enemy territory for the very first time and I remember his voice on the radio when he said, look, there's AAA right two o'clock, anti-aircraft artillery fire and we all stared at it. And then he said, there's a surface air missile left 10 o'clock and we all stared at this big surface air missile like a telephone pole coming up through the formation and we watched it explode. And then, he, then we heard on the radio, splash, MiG-29 and one of our F-15Cs had shot down a MiG-29 and we watched it hit the desert floor and explode. I remember that moment in the cockpit as a young captain because it came to me that, I, that nothing I was seeing or hearing was new. I had been in an environment just like this before at Nellis and at Jay Park Range and had been put in this situation. Every radio call, every formation, everything I was seeing is something that I'd been trained for. And in fact, I would share with you that I remember thinking this is actually easier than Red Flag because they threw everything at me plus the kitchen sink when I was there. And that moment in the cockpit produced this level of confidence that I knew that I could succeed in combat. I think that's what we're here to talk about. How do we ensure that the young captains, the young uh, airmen, the NCOs of today and tomorrow have that same confidence under fire that I had when I went into combat in Desert Storm? And so I look forward to the questions and the dialogue today because this is a shared obligation to ensure that we all remain committed to ensuring that these soldiers, settlers, airmen, and Marines go into harm's way with what they need to get the job done and we take care of their families while they're gone. Thank you. Thank you, General Goldfee. Mr. Pendleton. Chairman Sullivan, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me up to talk about our work on Air Force readiness. I think you're going to find that we're largely in agreement with the Air Force on the challenges going forward. Um, over the past quarter century, we've been tracking readiness, and we have seen it gradually but steadily decline, primarily because the Air Force has gotten smaller, but the demand has stayed high. Back in 2016, we urged the Department of Defense, including the Air Force, to develop a plan for readiness rebuilding. At that point, the Air Force felt that rebuilding the readiness of its force would take a decade or more, and only if they got increased budgets and a decreased pace of operations. Budgets have increased, but the pace has stayed high. Today, the Secretary testified, or in her statement actually, that the Air Force is aiming to have 80% of its over 300 operational squadrons ready within about five years. This is an aggressive goal. And to meet it, the Air Force is gonna to need to focus on the building blocks of readiness, as they are saying they intend to do. People, training, equipment. Let's talk about personnel briefly. The Air Force has shortfalls of both maintainers and pilots. Uh, the gap for maintainers, I think, is about to be closed, but it'll take time for them to grow experience. The pilot shortfall may take a bit longer. Uh, the retention incentives to date have not worked to meet goals, and I think so it may take a little bit longer for the Air Force to close. Regarding equipment, we have found, not surprisingly, that older equipment breaks down, breaks down more. Um, but it's not limited to the older aircraft uh, mission capability uh, challenges. The F-22 mission capability rates are well below desired levels, as you know. And 
it's partly because his aircraft are so maintenance intensive. They have this low observable coating on them that makes them difficult to work on. The F-35 is proving to be so costly to operate and sustain that it actually jeopardizes the program, as many of you know. DOD and the Air Force are working to try to get those costs down, and I think that will be critical. Training, as the Secretary mentioned, is another challenge area. The pace of Air Force operations have left little time for air crews to train. As the Air Force seeks to rebuild readiness, I agree that training may be one of the more difficult things to achieve, especially if demand is not dampened. This full spectrum mission of F-22, for example, is so complex that it takes most of the year to fully train for it. But we found questions about the way the F-22 is utilized. It's called away to participate in exercises that do don't give it much training value. It sits alert, gassed and ready, but not training. And they have to fly adversary air for each other because they often don't have dedicated adversary air in the vicinity. And that doesn't provide much uh, training value for the, uh, the red air. We made several recommendations to, uh, around organizing and utilizing the F-22 better, which the Air Force agreed with and I believe are beginning to take action. These are just a few highlights. In all, we've made uh, 14 readiness-related recommendations that I summarize in the back of my statement, and I'm happy to talk to you about any of those uh, as the hearing goes on. Looking to the future, I understand the Air Force's desire to get larger. Like the Navy, Air Force readiness has suffered as demands have stayed high while the force has shrunk. Like the Navy, the Air Force believes it needs to grow by about a quarter to meet future demands in the strategy. But regardless of future growth, the Air Force will have to keep much of its existing force structure for decades to come. Therefore, I agree the priority needs to be rebuilding the readiness of the existing fleet, certainly in the near term. Mr. Chairman, I'm encouraged by what I've heard from the Air Force today. They have taken several steps in the right direction. Now it's a matter of achieving results. Recovery won't be easy or fast. It took a quarter century for the Air Force to get here, so it may take a while to, to, to recover. We at GAO stand ready to assist you in your oversight. That concludes my remarks. I look forward to your questions, sir. Great. Thank you. And thanks again for all the good work that GAO has been doing in this area. Let me begin by, uh, Madam Secretary, this is a question for you. Um, the issue as it relates to the readiness of aircraft that are available that come into the, to the Air Force fleet. And in particular, uh, I'm thinking about the F-35. So uh, I saw just a couple days ago that Secretary Mattis ordered the Air Force and Navy to get mission capable rates uh, up to 80 percent. Um, I did a little sniffing around. I think Delta Airlines, um, their aircraft readiness in their fleet is about uh, 86 percent. I believe it's something along those lines. And yet for the F-35, that's a new airplane coming online, Coming out to the fleet, I think it's in the, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mid-60s. So why, why is there, A, such a disparity between military aircraft that are brand new and commercial aircraft, and can we get to, within a year, I know that's what the Secretary put in his memo, can we get to a rate of 80 percent, and how can we do that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the readiness recovery plan that we put together in the spring accelerates our readiness recovery by about six years and says that by the end of FY20, our pacing units, our most important units for a peer competition, of which we have 204 operational squadrons, that 80% of those will be at C1 or C2 readiness by the end of 2020. The Secretary of Defense has asked us to accelerate further uh, our F-16s, F-22s, and F-35s to the end of fiscal year 19 and come up with a plan to do that. Now, what we're focused on here is not the entire fleet. It's not the test and evaluation airplanes and those kind of things. Um, and so we have a situation where we actually are now standing up. We're not even at full operating capability for some of our squadrons. But we are focused on the operational squadrons and making sure that they are, they are at high levels 
of mission-capable readiness, both for their pilots, their equipment, and their training. So you'd ask, why? what are the challenges with the F-35 fleet with respect to sustainment? And is that would, number, like, in the mid-60s? Is that, That's correct, isn't it? It varies by squadron, significant variation by squadron. And I may ask the, the chief to jump in here on this, but I would say that there's a couple of issues. Obviously, um, one of them is that the spare parts lines did not start up fast enough. And that's something that, you know, predates all of us, but they were so focused on initial production, they didn't start up and really work the logistics system fast enough. The second and most obvious difference between an F-35 and an airliner is the low observable uh, coding and, it's, right. and the complexity, complexity of maintaining that. We are putting together a plan with, of course, the Joint Program Office, because this is a joint program, it is not an Air Force program, to get the supply line right so that, uh, that our operational squadrons can, can meet the goals that the, uh, that the Secretary of Defense has, has set out for us. Chief? Uh, Chairman, I just shared with you a couple weeks ago, I had a conversation with the Israeli Air Chief, uh, Amikam Norkin, and, uh, and he shared with me, he says, Dave, he said, we're, uh, he says, uh, I'm not uh, integrating the F-35 into the Israeli Air Force. I'm integrating the Israeli Air Force into the F-35. Hmm. And it was a telling statement on how this aircraft, this weapon system, uh, is looked at operationally as the quarterback of the joint and the allied team because it's really an information fusion engine. And so operationally, we're getting, we, we are seeing incredible capabilities coming out of this platform. Where we're focused, and, and I think uh, Mr. Pendleton said as well, is on that sustainment piece. And as an international air chief, uh, speaking on behalf of my fellow F-35 international air chiefs, we are working to drive the sustainment costs down so that they are on par with a fourth generation F-16, F-18, because that's what all of the air chiefs have put into their budgets. And so this is one that we're working with the department, uh, with the Joint Program Office, and with Lockheed Martin to ensure that we drive these sustainment costs down, and we're not going to stop until we see them on par. Mr. Pendleton, do you have any views on the uh, just the fleet readiness and why, you know, I know it's a complex aircraft, uh, only took almost two decades to procure and develop, which that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother hearing. Um, but uh, it does seem to me kind of ludicrous that we get new aircraft off the production line and, you know, within a month, the, they're at 65% readiness. I mean, what do you think is going on there? I think the Air Force focused on production and not enough on sustaining the aircraft, to, just to be blunt about it. And it's, it's uh, causing problems now. The depots are already several years behind. Uh, parts are a problem. And um, it's, it's going to be difficult to achieve those kind of mission capability rates. Now, I will say on mission capability rates, that whenever I hear a percentage, you know, I'm an auditor, uh, that's a numerator and a denominator. What, what exactly is in both of those I think will become very important. Okay. Uh, and we'll be watching that, of course. Great. Thank you. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Goldfein, with regard to the discussion about the, uh, the capabilities, the immediate capabilities, or at least the, the, uh, the, uh, between the F-22 and the F-35, we know that as low observable aircraft, both of them have some challenges because it's a technology that is difficult to maintain. And yet we changed the styling on the technology, the way that we handle low observability between the F-22 and the F-35. There's a reason for it. Part of it was is because we learned from the F-22. Would you like to share just briefly what we expect to get out of the F-35 that we couldn't get out of the F-22 in terms of low observability and making it easier to maintain the, uh, the, uh, the capabilities of the F-35. Thanks, sir. You know, we, we took all the learning from, and I, I flew the F-117, so we could say, you know, first generation and was a wing commander and responsible for low observable maintenance on the F-117. We learned from that, and we actually send F-117 uh, maintainers and pilots to the B-2 to, to learn. And then so throughout the evolution of low observable technology and maintenance, we've learned from every one of the generations, if you will, going forward. So we took everything we learned from the F-22 and we applied that to the F-35, not only in production, but now in terms of maintenance. How we do the coatings, how we, uh, how we achieve the low observability we need is a generation beyond what we are doing in both the F-22 and the, uh, and the B-2. The big story, though, on the F-35 is the information fusion. And, and I would just share you this way. When, when I was flying the F-16, I would go out for a mission, 
And then when I came back, pro my debrief was primarily to determine what I had missed, what didn't I see, what information was out there that I didn't collect, and how could I improve my ability to manage my systems to do that. The F-35 pilots are having a completely different debrief because it's all there. The question is, how did they fuse it and how did they act? Um, just to give you an example, you know, when an F-35 pilot is taxiing out, uh, he or she is already getting information fed into the cockpit on what's going on in the cyber world, in the space world, and they're already calling audibles. So going back to you know, what the Israeli Air Chief said, I'm integrating my entire Air Force into the F-35, and why we think about it as the quarterback, because it's able to call audibles real time in a really complex environment in ways that we've just not been able to do before. So it's this combination of low observability, allowing you to penetrate and persist, and the information fusion, what you can do once you're inside uh, an enemy environment that allows the F-35 to do what it does. If I could, what you're, what you're, what you're saying and what I'm hearing is, is that we're basically in a cutting edge technology that's gonna get a lot better. But yes, sir. we're learning as we go along, and this is a part of that learning curve that we're in right now. Yes, sir, and you can't, you can't uh, overestimate the importance of the international aspect of the F-35, yeah. because I've never been in a single fight where I've done it alone. Yeah. Every time I've gone into combat over the last uh, 28 years, we've been there side to side with our allies and partners, and the fact that they are in this weapon system with us is probably one of the most important outcomes of coalition warfare going forward. I think sometimes we forget about that, and, and, and I appreciate your bringing that up because those partnerships are critical to us. It's something that our near-peer adversaries do not have. Yes, sir. So, thank you. Uh, Secretary Wilson, I'm just curious. The, the, uh, there's going to be a discussion about whether we should be working on maintaining our existing force and bringing it up to speed versus adding new squadrons, more manpower, and so forth. But I think the two are integratable, and I think they cannot be separated. Would you care to share your thoughts about the need to not only increase, but to, so that we've actually got aircraft to do the mission that's necessary and what's doing, and then the reason why we're having problems right now in terms of the amount of hours we're expecting from the airframes that we've got mm. and, and the pilots that we've got on hand right now? Uh, Senator, job one is to restore the readiness of the force that we have. This committee asked the chief and I last March, uh, what is the Air Force you need to execute the national defense strategy. And we have a formal report that's due uh, to the Congress in March. So we, uh, we have a group within the Air Force. There's also MITRE Corporation and the, the uh, CSBA who are also doing independent looks at what is required in order to execute the national defense strategy. Certainly modernization and new concepts of operations, integration with the joint force, dependence on allies. But, but we've done quite a few uh, war games and modeling and simulation that do show that we are too small for what the nation is asking of us under the national defense strategy when we project forward to the 2025-2030 time frame in particular. And that's because we have returned to great power competition. We have a rapidly innovating adversary that is putting a, a lot of effort into the development of their military. And I think we have an obligation to you to be able to answer that question. What is the Air Force we need when we look at the rapidly innovating threat? And so that was the basis of our work in, uh, in saying we think it's, it's, it's about 386 squadrons in the 2025-2030 timeframe. Um, that, that will engender a debate on, on how we get there, can we get there, what are the resources required, uh, and we understand that. But it, at a minimum, we should be able to tell you what is needed. Mr. Chairman, I think one of the most critical pieces in what the Secretary has said is that the public is expecting that we will have the best Air Force and that we can handle our competitors, our near-peer competitors. And actually what she's saying is, is that without the increases that we need in manpower and in, in new squadrons, we're not able to meet that near-peer competition. Fair well, statement. Sir, uh, we are ready to fight tonight, there's no question. But when we project forward into 2025, 2030, with the intelli best intelligence estimates we have, that's where, uh, that's where the, the greatest issue is. And, uh, and so we can see what the adversary is doing and project forward as to what they plan to do. And, it, and we have an obligation to ma maintain dominance and air superiority to carry out the national defense strategy and provide options for the commander in chief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I had to step out. I'm, I'm going to say this even though it's not directly related, but I wanted to, I 
went out because there is an exhibit in the rotunda of young people who have overdosed, and these are portraits that are very dramatic, and this is an issue, I think, for all of us across our society, and so I would urge everybody to walk through the rotunda on your way out. The portraits were painted by a woman from New Hampshire, and that's how I'm connected to it. Um, I also wanted to just, I'm sorry that um, Senator Inhofe has left, because I wanted to respond to his comment about the last eight years of President Obama. And I think leadership and politics aside, one of the biggest challenges of the last eight years has been sequestration. And I raise it because if we don't make a change, we're looking at that coming again. And so I think we can't, we can't um, just suggest that it's been about leadership. It's been about our failure to provide the funding that our armed services has needed, and we better face up to that now because we're looking at it coming down the pike again. So I would urge us all to think about how we're gonna address that because these readiness challenges really got critical during the years when sequestration was in effect. So with that um, preface, I, I wanna begin, Secretary Wilson, by again thanking you and the Air Force for your very positive response to the contamination from PFAS that has been at the former Pease Air Force Base. You sent up um, John Henderson, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Installations, Environment, and Energy. He was very effective in meeting with residents of the community who had been affected um, and reassuring about the effort to address this issue, which um, I know everyone very much appreciated. I, I wanna ask you though, because one of the questions that came up was about the firefighting foams that contributed to the problem that we have at PEs. And what's being done, uh, there has been some concern about whether there's gonna be a new um, firefighting foam that's develop that can meet the same requirements to fight fires. So can you talk about, one of you talk about what you're seeing and what the prospects are to develop something that's just as effective? Uh, yes, Senator, I think I can. Uh, first of all, the Air Force, I think to its credit, and my, it was my predecessor who, who got us on this path, but, but uh, uh, went out proactively and assessed all of our bases. Uh, this particular foam was used in all kinds of firefighting, but the Air Force was only one of the entities that used it. And so we did an assessment. Um, we've completed that, as, uh, pretty much completed that assessment at all of the Air Force locations, uh, identified where we have problems and we're committed to fixing it and providing clean water uh, immediately when people are affected. With re we have also replaced this foam already uh, at Air Force locations with another kind of a, a fire retardant that doesn't contain that chemical. Um, well, that's really uh, good to hear because there was a hearing in a subcommittee of the Environment and Public Works Committee that raised questions about whether the Air Force has, in fact, replaced that firefighting foam. So I hope that that message will get sent loud and clear to everybody so that everybody understands that that, that has been done. So Senator, I'll take that back and we'll, we will uh, confirm that for you in writing. Uh, that'd be great, thank you very much. Um, I also, following up on that a little bit more, earlier this year, Senator Rounds and I introduced a PFAS Registry Act, which would have set up a national registry for everyone affected. There were pieces of that that are included in the McCain um, authorization bill. And I just wondered if you could talk about whether efforts have begun, if you're aware of efforts that have already begun within DOD to begin to set up this registry and what what we might need to do to support that. Senator, if I could take that one and go back and also get that answer for you in writing. Sure, that'd be great, thank you. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'll save my question for the next round. Okay, Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and of course to our witnesses, thank you very much for being here today. We certainly appreciate your service and your commitment to our great United States of America. Um, General Golfin, I'd like to start with you, please, sir, and uh, thank you very much for acknowledging the fact that we need to uh, man, train, and equip our uh, service members. And the training is very important, whether it's simulation or whether it's actual exercises in the air, uh, that muscle memory 
memory and those rehearsals are very, very important. And, and you are right when it comes down to it, um, to be able to respond immediately in a time of crisis. Very important, so thanks for acknowledging that. Um, I know that, that many of us here on the committee have been following uh, the physiological episodes that have been occurring uh, in our flying communities, and I am confident in saying that, that all of us are committed to ensuring the safety of our pilots. And so I am happy to hear that the Air Force has joined with the Navy now, and we have a joint physiological episodes action team, or JPEAT, uh, to share information and really get out after this problem, so congratulations on that. I am aware that there has been some progress made uh, with regard to resolving these PE issues in the Air Force trainer fleet. Can you share with the committee this progress and then how it impacts uh, resolving PE issues in other platforms as well? Yes, ma'am, thanks. The, in, the, in the T6, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is the aircraft that we've been most recently having the, the physiological episodes. As you mentioned, we put together a team with the Navy, went and looked at it, and we were able to drive down to the point where with, fair, with high confidence, what we found is that it's the, it's the concentration of oxygen levels at various parameters of flight mm. that was falling behind what was required. So at, uh, at a, you know, in different maneuvers and different flying in certain of the aircraft, uh, the concentration levels were off. And so, the way we're attacking this is through or near term, long term. In the very near term, now that we've identified what the root cause is, we've looked at all of the maintenance practices because uh, the Navy has T6s, we have T6s. Mm -hmm. We compared the best practices of both services, and we've changed significantly the way we are maintaining every part of the of the system to ensure that we can mitigate and, and minimize any implications of having uh, the concentration values not be optimum. And the second thing what we're doing is we're really out there, we're out there and we're talking to the force. We learned with the F-22 when we went through that, mm -hmm. that when we were doing all of our analysis, we stopped a dialogue with the operators and their families. And they, said they started wondering and questioning what we were doing. So this has been an inclusive, transparent dialogue throughout. So now we've sent a team out with a one-star general that's briefed every one of our T6 pilots, and we've talked to families and town halls to make sure they know exactly what's going on. The, the long-term solution to this is going to be a redesign of this system to ensure that we have the concentration levels right. And we have a team right now that's doing the redesign. And then as soon as they come to us with the solution, that's going to be a priority for the secretary and I to move forward. Okay, very good. So you mentioned that that was um, the the T6 as well, the F-22, and you're applying that to other platforms as yeah. well then. Okay. Well, I do appreciate that. It's been very concerning, and, and we're glad to see the attention really being paid by both the Air Force and the Navy to the PE. Um, so I appreciate that, and thank you for mentioning the families, because that's a great lead-in to the question I have for Secretary Wilson. And thank you, Secretary, for being here as well. And I chair the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, and I have had the opportunity to learn about SOCOM's success with preservation of the force and family program. And we ask a lot of our airmen and their families, and we all want to provide them with the absolute best possible support we can. And I understand it may not be possible to apply POTUF all across uh, the department, but um, is there a way that we could incorporate parts of that program uh, with folks in, in the Air Force? Uh, we know that it has been very help, helpful to uh, those that are in the special operations community and AFSOC, and we'd like to see pieces or parts of that shared with the greater Air Force as well. Are there ideas or, or things that could be applied? Senator, we're trying that out at four different bases. We call it Operation True North. And it's, uh, the concept is to embed the caregivers in the squadrons where people are mm -hmm. uh, uh, for both mental health, uh, spiritual well-being, um, but also physical health. And one of the, one of the, uh, one of the, the outcomes from SOCOM is, is if someone's in, in the same unit and they're responsible for mental health, there's conversations that go on that are easier to have than if you have to make an appointment over at the clinic and walk through that door. The second part on physical health, we've actually found that by embedding, you know, we're, we're 
taking care of high performance athletes. Right. Uh, and by embedding physical trainers with the units, it's not about what you can't do, it's about how you can do. And the number of injuries and, uh, and you know, uh, 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 the, the reluctance to go see a doc, because if you go see the doc, they're gonna take you offline status and it's just, it's hard to get back, back on. And so there's a reluctance to get help as opposed to, I was with a special operator down at Hurlburt who said to me, it's been the best thing. He was out there working out and the physical trainer just said, you know, and then he said, yeah, my back's been bothering me. And he said, well, let me watch you lift. And he said, this is here. Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how to strengthen those muscles. He said, I feel like a young man. I've never felt this good because I'm training properly now and I didn't have to go to the doc. So it's a, it's a different approach to maintaining the human weapon system and, uh, and resilience by incorporating that into how we operate the squadrons. I appreciate that, um, and it is a very important program, and if there are things that we can do to assist in that effort, please let us know. I'm a huge fan of the POTIF programs. So thank you all very much for being here today. Appreciate it, thank you. Senator Perdue. Mr. Chairman, welcome to your new role. Thank I look forward to working with you on this. I wanna make one comment for the record uh, for our guests here today. You know, I, I think this is one of the most important meetings we could have. The timing is perfect, as the Chief said privately before we started. Uh, I'm chagrined, though, and again, that with an important meeting like this, we're all double, triple booked, yeah. and so the attendance here is not, it's disrespectful to these witnesses. I want that for the record, and we, with your leadership, I know we can, we can change that. Well, thank you, and, 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 the, and you raise a good point. There's like several other hearings happening literally right now. Well, this is really important. We're all d double booked. We're all triple missing booked. something else to be here, but I think this is absolutely critical. Chief. Uh, I'm worried, as an old manufacturing guy, I'm worried about our supply chain. I'm worried about our defense, our uh, industrial base. I look at the F-35, though, and their decisions that were made that you guys have inherited, uh, where we've got that supply chain spread all over the world, for whatever reason, social, economic, I don't know. But it certainly wasn't with national defense in, in mind. So I want to know, what, what can we do? Eric Schmidt said that uh, if there's one tech, uh, bringing technology into the force, both in, in current readiness and in developing the recap that you guys are going to have to face over the next 20 uh, or next 10 years. And by the way, um, Secretary, I couldn't agree more. I'm not worried about where we are today. I have full faith in you guys today. I'm worried about what China has said publicly about Made in China 2025. 25 and beyond, I'm really concerned about. So that leads to this question. Eric Smith had the, uh, Obama's appointee of the Defense Innovation Advisory Board, and he said this. He said that uh, um, bringing new technology into force is the biggest concern. If there was one variable to solve for, it would be speed. In competing with these guys, they don't have the same constraints that we do. He also said, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but that require, the, the requirement process we have in DOD is now the single greatest barrier to rapid technological advancement. And by advancement, he means not development, but deployment. So, sir, what, when we look at both recapping and improving our readiness today, where are we in terms of, of working with the industrial base and the supply chain that you guys have inherited to sort of get at this? And I'd like maybe both of you, I see your head nodding, Secretary, both of you may have, have a comment on this, but I, I think this is a number one threat that we have right now. Senator, I'm glad you bring this up because it is something that we are both really focused on and taking advantage of the new authorities that you have given us to move at speed. And let me give you a couple of examples. One is with the F-35. The Defense Department in the Air Force is terrible at buying software. So we changed the way we're buying software. We set up a, a software factory called Kessel Run in, uh, outside of Boston um, to be able to, to do development operations, so rapid insertion of technology in an iterative way. We just this last week went out to, um, to Nellis, uh, where we are. there's a logistics system that supports the F-35 called ALIS, A-L-I-S, which is not very, it, it can't scale, it's got huge problems, it drives the maintainers nuts. And so, so we put together a team of Lockheed Martin Air Force programmers, the maintainers on the flight line, and said, let's do DevOps and figure out where the problems are and try to rapidly get tools to the warfighter to fix Alice. They named themselves, um, the, the new program is called Mad Hatter rather than Alice. Um, it's always the young techies that come up with something. But it's not only that. 
Let me give you a couple examples of where we're moving very quickly. And Eric Schmidt is right. We are, we're actually partnering with DIUX in some of our uh, space enterprise kinds of things. We now have a, we started in January a space enterprise consortium. We've got over 200 companies now involved. 150 of them are non-traditional companies. We have done 32 prototypes with greater than $100 million in total value of those 32 prototypes. The average time between solicitation to award is 90 days. We've given four awards just since January for rapid launch of small satellites partnering with DIUX at $15 million to, to get small satellites up in the air and do it fast. We just broke into four program executive offices in our Space and Missile Systems Center rather than one all the way at the top of a $6 billion enterprise. And by doing that, we cut out three layers of bureaucracy in getting capability to the warfighter. And we set out nine pace setter projects to show how to go fast to acquire space systems. And those nine pace setters cut 19 years out of their acquisition timelines. And they have a number of other uh, pace setters in line saying, hey, we want to do it this way too. So we are using the authorities for prototyping and experimentation that you have given us. We are stripping out layers of bureaucracy. We have pushed down authority to program managers and give, given them the power to move quickly, um, to use competition. Uh, and uh, the final thing I would say is we're, we're partnering with our allies. Uh, we partnered with Norway on a satellite communications, polar uh, satellite communications, where we had a two-year gap. We closed the two-year gap, saved $900 million by partnering with Norway. We're doing the same on another project with Japan. So the Air Force is trying to take the authorities you've given us and move forward to go faster and smarter on acquisition. And, sir, just to add quickly. Sounds like she might have prepared for that question, Chief. I'm not I, it's a big deal for us. I mean, I, this is a really it is big deal. It is a big deal. I agree. Uh, so Secretary Wilson and I hosted our four-star conference last week, and the guest speaker was Eric Schmidt. Good. And we asked him to talk to us about how do we bring the future faster. And I'm often asked the question, hey, Chief, what is, a, what is, what is you know, nine years of continuing resolutions, what does that do to you? And I, I tell them it, it, it really wreaks havoc on our ability to plan totally. for the future. But to your question, then I always follow up and say, but let me tell you what it does to our industry partners. So I have to go to a CEO and tell them, listen, I don't know what I'm going to buy next year. But, and, I, and I haven't gotten my money yet, but I'm hoping I'll get it in the last half of this year, and then I'm going to buy as many weapons as I can. But if I don't, we're going to interrupt the current plan. That's right, and, and, I, and I can't give you any projections of what the future right. looks like, so you need to keep this very sophisticated workforce occupied right. with this level of uncertainty. And so it goes directly. So I would offer to you, in addition to the Secretary's great points, is that the, the, the John McCain National Defense Act that you passed said such a powerful signal right. to airmen, soldiers, settlers, Marines that you're behind them. And it sent an equally powerful signal to industry mm. that says you can now plan your future and manage your workforce to get us what we need. I'll give you one more to send to them. This year, we did something we haven't done in 22 years. And we didn't get 100%. We got to 90% funding by the end of August because we stayed here in August. You can tell your service people that were on the, on the wall that month, uh, this is not something that's never going to be done again. Yeah. We, did, we funded the military this year without a CR, and we know now what it's doing. Speaking of that, I asked a, uh, uh, an F-22. I'm sorry, I'm past time. I didn't no, go ahead. They, they fill it's, a it's fine. on this. No, I'll come go back ahead. and do that in the second round. It's a good question. No, I want to come back because I'm going to brag on the state of Alaska. If you, promise, if you promise to stay for the second yes, round, I will. otherwise I'll let you Thank go. you. I'm sorry. Well, I do, I do want to uh, mention that uh, Senator Perdue and uh, Senator Ernst have been leaders on this issue that he's just talking about. They're both on this special committee that's going to hopefully fix our budget problems. And we've made progress this year, and nobody benefits more than that than the military. Well, we're, we'll, uh, we'll start here with uh, round two, which I, I think is uh, great that we have. I, I do want to just do a small correction for the record. You know, uh, General, I appreciated your opening statement. I, I will mention, though, uh, just, you know, even if one deploys, gets a combat fit rep, gets eminent danger pay, there's combat vets, and I don't consider myself one, but uh, particularly in the category of somebody like you, so I'm just... Uh, saying that for the record. Um, I think it's important, actually, because we know who the real, you know, folks are, and I, I, I always want to keep that record straight. Um, Madam Secretary, I wanted, 
I know you've been focused on the acquisition issues. Can you a little bit more unpack what you were talking about uh, in your opening statement on this issue, 100 years to 56 years? I didn't, I didn't fully follow that. I know it's important. I know you've been really focused on it. Senator Perdue just asked a question, but what, what were you getting at there? Senator, we have a, a great team that we put together. Some of them are military, some civil servants, and of course, Will Roper, who is our Assistant Secretary for Acquisition. And when they, when they all got together six months ago now, and they said, all right, what should, well, what should be our goals? What, what should be some of the things we're trying to achieve to get, get things faster? And one of them was to say, let's look at all of our programs and try to strip 100 years out of our schedules. Um, by using the new authorities that you've given us, by trying to tailor our acquisition authorities uh, so that we get things faster. And usually when you get them faster, they also cost less. Time is money. And so, so they're at 56 years so far, and they've got another six months to go to keep stripping time out of, out of schedules. And when you went through that uh, exercise, did you see any additional authorities that you think you need from us? One, again, I, there's a lot of... John McCain here in this hearing, but as you know, he was very focused on this issue. And in the last few NDAAs, we did give significant authorities back to the service secretaries and the chiefs to make things work. What, what else do you need? Senator, I wouldn't identify, we're now on the point of execution, and I think we're trying to execute in a way that is fast and smart. And also, the other part that we said was we want to be even more transparent than we are with traditional acquisition, so that we are fully open about what we're doing and what results we're getting. I do think that there's tremendous promise in several of these, particularly prototyping. And, and the reason why is that in traditional acquisition, you would come up with an analysis of alternatives, and you'd be three or four years into this, and all you really got are stacks of paper and studies. You really don't know what technically what is technically possible yet. If you prototype, you develop a real engineering technical understanding of what really is within the realm of the possible. We're using it for next generation engines. We've got competitive prototyping with two of the big engine manufacturers to develop an, an adaptive engine that gets 10% more thrust 25% more fuel efficiency. They may not get quite there, but we've said, build us something. See what you can get. And then it will inform our requirements for a whole next generation of Air Force engines. But it, imagine what it does to, we're the biggest buyer of fuel in the Defense Department. 25% increase in fuel efficiency yeah. and a 10% increase in thrust, that's a game changer. Right. And so we're just trying it. I want to go to the uh, GAO uh, study. Uh, Sir, I just wanted to uh, reemphasize the point, Senator Mashaheen, you made, which is the other thing to your question is sequestration is still the law of the land. Yeah. And when, when uh, just to make the, your point again, ma'am, you know, we grounded the United States Air Force in 13. We created no fly zones across the United States of America where we stopped flying. We still have not recovered. If that comes back, yeah. it, will, it will undermine and devastate every, all the good work that you did in the recent bill. No, I agree with Senator Shaheen on that, certainly. Um, let me uh, go to the GAO study as it relates to the F-22s, Mr. Pendleton. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of important aspects to that. That still is an incredible aircraft. The President talks about it a lot. It is a remarkable aircraft. Again, that was, you, you can't look back and kind of wring your hands, but that was probably a pretty significant mistake to curtail the production and deployment of that aircraft. But can you summarize quickly your recommendation? It's my understanding that the secretary and the uh, chief agree with those. How are you looking, or that you've concurred in those, how are you looking to implement these recommendations that relate to you know, the small fleet that's not maximized, the organization with regard to the Air Force, the mission, as you, you said, what can we do? This is still a tremendous fifth-gen aircraft that, um, you know, your work is important in this. Can you talk about that quickly? And if there's any comments from the service secretary or the chief, uh, I'd welcome that too. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, we have two major findings. Um, we found that the organization, the small fleet, could be suboptimal. Um, locations. Can you with, find that it is suboptimal? Yeah, we think it, we think it is. It could be, but it currently is? We think it is suboptimal, okay. yes. That's important. Um, locations with fewer squadrons, people, uh, aircraft had lower mission capability rates. 
than those with more. Uh, again, this was an unclassified version of a classified report, so I'm having to be a bit general about that. Okay. We recommended that the Air Force take a look at the way they had the F-22 uh, force organized. You can go a couple of ways. You can, you can co-locate, co-locate more aircraft if you, if you want to and get some uh, efficiencies, we think, from that. You can also look at the way that you deploy packages from within the squadron. I mean, what was happening is the Air Force was breaking out a portion of the squadron and, and, and sending that forward, and it's, and it's basically leaving what's left broken as well. So you could augment that, and we tried not to be too specific in the, in the recommendation so the Air Force would have some room to maneuver on that. The, the second um, uh, had to do with the way the Air Force is utilizing the F-22. Um, there, it's being used for a lot of missions that we don't think contribute to its training for a high-end fight, things like alert, um, and, and appearing in exercises, as I mentioned in my opening statement, that really don't give them much value. Um, we think that needs to be relooked as well and made recommendations. The Air Force did concur with us, and I know from speaking with Secretary Wilson, they're thinking about this. So are, are you looking to implement these, uh, General Goldfein or Secretary Wilson? Yes, sir, we are. We are looking. Uh, it's interesting that when you go back to 2010, we retired 10 squadrons, 252 aircraft, in 2010 based on a demand signal that shifted those resources into other areas as space, cyber, ISR, nuclear enterprise. And those were, those were strategic trades that we had to make at the time, if you remember what we were in in that time frame. Um, but we didn't take down any flags or we didn't take down any squadrons. We just made all the squadrons smaller. Hmm. And we got to a point where we, did not, we were less and are less efficient than we can be with larger squadrons when it comes to achieving and, and meeting the demands of the national defense strategy. So we are absolutely looking at not only the F-22, but all of our weapon systems to determine how can we get back up into that optimum solution. But we also understand that that's a discussion that we have to have with this committee yeah. and with the Congress before we do anything. Doesn't that help the maintainer issue as well if you consolidate some of the uh, F-22s in terms of where they're located? It, it does. And it's, a, it's, a, it's across the board, it's, it's maintenance, it's the back shop maintenance, it's all those parts that, that you need to be able to project air power, not only for the F-22, but uh, for all the weapon systems. But for us, uh, you know, I, in the active duty and in the Air National Guard and Reserves, what we found is that a 24 uh, assigned aircraft is the optimum solution to be able to do the national defense strategy business. Many of ours are now at the 18 number, and yeah. so we need to build those up to 24, and then we need to have, hit an optimum solution in the Guard and Reserve as well. So that's all part of our planning. Right. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, DOD's final report in 2018 on organization man- management structure for the national security space components of the Department of Defense. I had to read it because it's such a long title. But it stated basically that space operations force will include space personnel from all military services, including guard, reserve, and civilians. I I wanted to ask you, Secretary Wilson, about the current role of the Air National Guard in the space domain and um, if you could elaborate on what, how you expect that role to evolve in the future. Senator, we have about a thousand guardsmen and about a thousand plus or minus reservists who are part of some part of a of a space mission, um, and uh, and I think uh, you know we're we're at a point where uh, the Defense Department is looking at how do we organize this going forward. The president has initiated the process to establish a U.S. space force and put out there a bold vision with respect to it. To it. And we all know that we can no longer view space as a function. It's a warfighting mission. So those discussions are ongoing. Uh, I believe that it's important for the Guard. And you know, sometimes I think when we look at some of these issues, we forget the Guard and Reserve. And they're an important component of the total force and particularly important component of the United States Air Force. And we want to make sure that that's in the conversation. Um, I appreciate that. And certainly there's been some interest from our Air Guard in New Hampshire about what's going to happen in this arena. And I know that in your September memo on the proposal to transition to a Space Force, you discussed the potential to transition National Guard units to a reserve component. Is that, 
I assume there's more discussion going on on this, but what, uh, Senator, you... there, there's a lot of discussion going on, and uh, uh, you know our team may have misused just the the reserve component to being both the guard and the reserve. So, so uh, the intention though is to make sure that we don't, as we address the space force, that we don't ignore the fact that we, while it's small, we do have components in the guard and reserve who are engaged in space. That's great. I appreciate that. Um, and as I said, there's been a great deal of interest in New Hampshire on what's going to happen there. I'm sure that's true of other states as well. Um, in terms of the number of squadrons, you called for growing the Air Force from its current size to 386 squadrons by 2030. And under that plan, tanker squadrons would see significant growth. They would increase from 40 to 54 squadrons. Can you talk about why you see this as being important? Uh, Senator, the, uh, the analysis that we did was, uh, was uh, based on the National Defense Strategy, which sets out for us what do we need to do? What are the missions we need to accomplish? And then what are the most important operational problems? But when we looked at those, when you look at those missions, there, there are really five things we have to do at the same time. We have to defend the homeland. We have to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. We have to be able to defeat a peer while also deterring a rogue state and then maintain pressure on violent extremist organizations at the same time. So, so it's all five of those things. We know that you know, currently when we look at a peer threat, um, Russia is very strong, China is modernizing very rapidly, and when we project into the 2025-2030 timeframe, our pacing threat we believe is China. So the, uh, the challenge in the Pacific is the tyranny of distance, and that means tanker squadrons are very important. So, so that, that, I believe, is what in the numerous iterations of modeling and simulation the war games we did really did drive the need for tankers. Well, I appreciate that, especially as with peas being one of the um, bases that's going to get some of the new tankers. Can you also talk about the interest that we have in making investments to protect that tanker force during a conflict because I, I know there's been some concern about what we need to do um, prospectively to make sure that we're doing that should we have um, an adversary that we need to protect those tankers against. Um, Senator, I wouldn't want to go into too much detail in an open session, uh, but uh, the intention is for for, uh, for new tankers to be more defendable than their predecessors. I don't know if, if the chief can go any further than that. I would just say that in the, as in the Joint Chiefs, and I give uh, Chairman Dunford a lot of credit for leading the Joint Chiefs as we've been looking at global campaign plans, and it's allowed us to move off a of platform discussion into more of our multi-domain operations that looks at not only, that, that looks at a platform as part of a family of systems that all connect together. So the discussion then about you know, how we would defend a tanker or any other part of the family is an integrated joint and allied solution going forward as opposed to a platform v. platform discussion, which is, I think, more 20th century than where we're headed. So, Mr. Chairman, is there any plan to have a classified follow-up hearing or briefing on to this Absolutely. so that we can learn more about some of the issues that have been a, raised. I think that's a great idea. That would be. Yes, we'll thank do it. Good. Thank that's you. great. Thank you. Thank Senator you very Ernst. much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about maintenance this morning, and I uh, appreciate that very much. We all value our maintainers very much, and I know it's very different having maintainers in a, a transportation uh, ground unit than having maintainers in um, in your squadrons, but uh, just really understanding how very important it is. And, and Secretary, in your written statement, you did reference some of the challenges uh, that you're facing in regard to sustainment of weapon systems, of equipment, um, particularly with regard to the maintenance and the logistics. And I was pleased to see that the Air Force does continue to look for ways to improve efficiency and cost effectiveness. So again, going back to emerging threats and capabilities, 
disabilities, one of the things that we spend some time talking about is artificial intelligence. And we do continue to hear about the potential benefits of AI and machine learning on issues such as predictive maintenance. And is the Air Force currently utilizing these types of technologies, or do you think these emerging technologies present maybe a cost-effective uh, means of improving maintenance and logistics within the Air Force? Senator, a very good question. We are actually uh, uh, testing out what we call conditions-based maintenance plus, which involves both uh, predictive analytics and also sensing uh, uh, on aircraft. We're trying them initially on the B-1 and the C-5, and we're seeing a significant reduction in cost, but also a reduction, about 30% reduction in unscheduled maintenance. So this is you're predicting when a part is likely to fail, and you change that part when it's in for its mm -hmm. inspection rather than waiting for it to fail out on the flight line. We are, uh, we're now trying to develop it, uh, the apps to move that uh, and, and propagate it throughout the rest of the fleet. Um, we're also doing some other things with respect to driving down the cost. We, we set up an office and we'll give it a two-year run and then take a look as to how much it saved us called the Rapid Sustainment Office to try to use advanced manufacturing technologies, 3D printing of metals, uh, but also things like cold spray technology to repair parts rather than replace them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just as one example, there was a recent article about uh, some of our, um, our airmen out in California who, uh, you know, we have a part that heats water on the back of a KC-10. The handle keeps breaking. Because they only buy about, they're not in manufacture anymore, and because they only buy maybe, you know, five of them a year, um, they're pretty expensive to go back and have somebody tool it the old way. In fact, Defense Logistics Agency was quoting some hum just a, a completely unreasonable cost, and so we 3D print them for 50 cents. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things can drive down the cost. Mm -hmm. And the, since you brought that up, um, I was out at 29 Palms uh, earlier this year, and we had that discussion about 3D printing of parts to make it readily available for our men and women that are out in the field. They're forward deployed. Uh, the supply chain is, is not as easy uh, in those types of environments. And uh, any thoughts then on patents? Um, there's a lot of concern from industry that we'll be able to replicate various parts, uh, replacement parts, and not uh, give full credit to the, the industries that have originally manufactured and designed those parts. Any thoughts on where we should be going in, in that space? Senator, we're trying to go to a place where, where we get the intellectual, intellectual property or negotiate for a license okay. to build things. Uh, just in the first quarter of last year, we had 10,000 requests for parts where there was not a single bidder. You look at something like the C5, it's not being produced anymore. The parts aren't being produced anymore. So, so the door handle breaks on the back of a C5 and you don't have a parts supplier. So we are 3D printing those in metal. We're also uh, using technologies now. The Army, Navy, and Air Force are, are working together on advanced manufacturing, but the chafing on, uh, on rivet holes on aircraft or uh, on the uh, hydraulics lines to be able to repair those by low temperature but high speed spraying of nanoparticles of metal mm -hmm. to, to basically uh, repair the metal rather than replace the part. It's much less expensive and keeps our mission capable rates higher. So the rapid sustainment office is intended to use these technologies, rapidly get them into the field, onto our aircraft, and reduce the cost and increase our mission capable rates. I, I love that. Um, incredible cost savings and innovation and, and to be able to do it right on the spot too. Very good, thank you very much. Senator Perdue. Following up on that, I, I want to applaud what you guys are doing in shared services. Back in the 80s, <clears throat> manufacturers in the commercial space did this, where they can have multiple divisions. You, you have a technical specialty. You develop that specialty. Uh, before, every, every one of the divisions would have that. They would protect it. They were jealous of it. Uh, when we took it away, created shared services. When you're doing C-130J maintenance at an Air Force base for the Navy, I, I, I applaud that. I think that's a, a way for the future. And I want to move over 3D printing. The Marines right now are doing a great job of, in their depots of doing the same sort of thing. You know, the, the supply chain is gone. Nobody's making the part. 3D printing, they're really gearing that up. And I would, I would encourage 
the Air Force to partner with your sister services to uh, make sure that we're at the cutting edge of that. Um, uh, Chief, I have a question, and, and I would second uh, Secretary, or, uh, Senator Shaheen's uh, comment about a classified briefing on the same topic. And, and Chief, you may want to take this off, but hypersonics and directed energy, uh, I know you guys are working on that. We, uh, General Hyten gave us an update earlier this year about what the Air Force is now seeing that our near peer competitors are doing. Can you give us an update on, on that development, on those two areas? Yes, sir. And uh, probably the most important development has been a discussion that the, secret the three service secretaries have had about how we partner together on areas like hypersonics and directed energy. And so what I want to do is maybe, ma'am, turn it over to you, and then I'll follow up at the end if we like. Okay, thank you. Senator, the three service secretaries, we, we, uh, we get together. We actually like each other and uh, get together for <laughs> breakfast every two weeks. <laughs> Terrifies the staff. Um, and uh, we, um, one of the things, one of our early meetings looked at where do we have science and technology investments that are similar, and can we work together uh, better? And one of the first ones we identified was hypersonics. We got our teams together. We rapidly developed a memorandum of understanding where we will take uh, we, we will take best technology, go fast, share uh, share results, and work together. Um, and as a result, on hypersonics, the additional funding you allowed us to put in in 17 and 18 is about 107 million dollars in additional funding. But by using a Navy-developed warhead for the Army and putting it on an Air Force system, we're actually going to prototype a system five years faster and get it uh, get it out there in 2021. Is that a defensive? It weapon? is. It is. Uh, it's called hacksaw. It is an offensive weapon. Okay. With regard to the F-22 that we talked about earlier, I had a privilege to visit uh, an advanced squadron up in Alaska. Get a plug there. That's right. uh, and the colonel, uh, <laughs> it gave us an update about how um, CRs directly impact them. They had training going on. They had to interrupt it, bring them back, and they had it documented down to the cents how much it cost them. But we talked about the, the use of the F-22, and you mentioned it in your opening comment, that you know we're using F-22s, our fifth gen, to chase TU-95s around up there on the line of demarcation. Uh, and I know, Secretary, you guys are talking about a, a light attack aircraft, I believe, um, that you're developing now to take on some of these more mundane uh, tasks that, and use the fifth gen for mainly training to, to do what you mentioned in your opening remark. Can you update us on the light attack uh, program? So we can we completed two experiments in the light attack, and the idea, you know, the, the second line of the second line of effort, the national defense strategy talks about uh, strengthening our allies and partnerships because when it comes to global competition uh, and co and war, we have allies and our adversaries generally don't, and it's a strategic advantage. So we as a service, when we looked at, you know, at, at from the air component standpoint, how can we leverage our ability? Because what I hear very often from my international air chiefs, especially those that are not into the fourth or fifth generation, either they can't afford it or not getting into it, yeah. but yet they have violence within their borders. Yeah. And the strategy is to drive violence down to the point where it can be handled within the sovereign territory. So the light attack experiment was primarily about line of effort to and allies and partners and how can we produce a commercial off the shelf that's a, uh, a, a low end system that's very affordable, that has low costs when it comes to sustainment, and that can help our allies and partners. And what we've learned in the past is that if we don't buy some, they won't. And so as we look at it internal to our Air Force, the Marines looking at this as well, this is a joint effort going forward. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to actually spread uh, our uh, coalition, if you will, to be able to get at the strategy and line of effort number two. And within the Air Force, we're also looking at it to the point where exactly what you described, which is, can I now go after those lower end missions with a tailored commercial off the shelf kind of product that will then free the high end assets to focus on the training and execution and the high end work we need to do? Thank you. Well, I want to. Okay, we have uh, Senator Kane here, and uh, I'm glad he made it back in time. It's an important hearing, and appreciate you uh, being here. I am I am uh, scheduled to go preside right at 11, so I'm going to have either one of my colleagues uh, on the Republican side or Senator Kane take over the hearing. But I, I do want to 
thank the witnesses uh, again for um, this very important hearing. There will be uh, QFRs for the record uh, that I, uh, if we can get those back uh, in a timely manner. And then I think Senator Shaheen's idea, which we all support on a classified version of this hearing, uh, respecting your time, uh, Madam Secretary and General Goldfein, uh, I think that would be a good follow-up. So I'm gonna pass the gavel to uh, one of my colleagues here, I'll let them fight over it, but again, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank all of you. I would normally be here, but the uh, presiding officer duty is something I'm not supposed to be late for, and I think I'm already late, so thank you very much. Look, and and I, will, I will just be very brief, and I apologize for missing. I, I was introducing a non-controversial nominee at a Judiciary Committee hearing, but just because my nominee was not controversial, that didn't mean that there were not other controversies that I was unaware of when I walked into the room. So that's why I'm a, a little bit late. And I don't want to belabor points that have been uh, asked. L let me just ask this. I, I indicated uh, in my opening uh, comment that I am worried about how we're planning on the readiness side with respect to infrastructure. I cited the Air Force example. I could have cited other examples. Um, the Navy base in Richmond, whose main road in and out to the center of naval power in the world is increasingly underwater just based on normal tidal action, not even to extreme weather events. Perhaps if you could each kind of talk about in the Air Force portfolio, I use the example of permafrost melting at the one base and how that changes MILCON, how, how you're dealing with some of these weather-related effects, extreme weather events, whatever the cause is, you're thinking about uh, MILCON projects uh, going forward. If you would each address that, that will be my only question. Well, Senator, with a, with a hurricane headed for Eglin and Tyndall today, uh, yeah. we're, we're dealing with those things. But I would, let me take the broader issue about infrastructure, because we are, uh, we did a really good, uh, what I thought was a good piece of work, uh, stewarded by our Assistant Secretary for Installations and Environment, John Henderson, but done by a group of captains. Uh, initially that said, we now have data on all of the infrastructure in the Air Force, every installation, every building on it, down to when their roof needs to be replaced. And they did some modeling and simulation on it, on how we can change the way we maintain our infrastructure. Uh, and they made some recommendations. One is, we have been funding the worst infrastructure first. So we wait until it gets really expensive to fix, and then we fix it. That's the wrong strategy. So we need to fix it before, like most commercial industry does, before it gets to be really expensive. The second is, they recommended taking the 5% of our worst infrastructure off the books. So the stuff that's hanging around from the Korean War that we should not be maintaining anymore. More, just, and so we actually are gonna be putting some money for destruction and disablement into our budget. The third is we are going to have to tick up our replacement value, uh, uh, our funding of our infrastructure a bit over the long term. But if we do those things um, uh, over the long term, our infrastructure gets much better over time, uh, and we're able to uh, we're able to to keep the infrastructure in much better shape. So they've given us a strategy. Uh, we have the modeling and simulation of our facilities, which tells us um, uh, uh, the final thing that we also are doing is every facility will have a mass master plan. Our commanders change too quickly to have just uh, what the commander wants now because those projects are always in the future. So, so we have a master plan for every facility and we will continue to execute projects on that master plan. So there are a number of things we're doing to improve the management of our infrastructure and planning associated with it. Other witnesses have uh, comments to add on this question, General? Sir, just uh, one comment uh, to add to the Secretary's we also, as a land-based force, project power, of course, from our bases. So we need to be the best in the world at defending those bases. And so the Secretary and I have a really concerted effort over the course of this year that looking at integrated base defense in addition to the investment we're making in MILCON projects because not only do we have to invest in it and build it, we also have to defend it. And that's central to who we are. Thank you. Mr. Pendleton, and I have one last question for you. Um, you testified before the SASC last year on the tragic uh, Navy collisions and analyzing uh, what was at fault there and what we could do better. Uh, are there parallels in the work that you did on those after action uh, analyses and things that we should be focused on with respect to the Air Force, avi you know, aviation mishaps, gaps in training? Are there things that we, you learned in that capacity that we should apply to the Air Force as well? I, I, yeah, there are parallels, but I, I think that what happened with the Navy is the situation in Japan just got away from them. Um, 
And we had warned a couple of years before, as you recall probably from my testimony, that they needed to take a look at the risk they were taking out there. And um, they didn't listen to us. <laughs> and so I'm not seeing it with the Air Force. But now having said that, there are parallels, shortfalls of people, uh, shortfalls of maintainers, running equipment hard, um, make, having it take longer to fix when you bring it in, um, and, and too little time to train. Right. I mean, that was one of the, the big problems with the Navy, as you, I'm sure you recall. They were working so hard they didn't have time to train on ba things as basic as seamanship. Um, like the eight in the Navy also, the Air Force has a demand problem, sir. I mean, the, the, the demands on it have continued to remain high. And like I said during the Navy hearing, I think it's going to be difficult for them to rebuild unless some of the demands are moderated. Thank you. Uh, do my other colleagues have any additional questions? Um, well, with that, we really appreciate your testimony. Uh, we'll keep the record open uh, until... Uh, 5 o'clock tomorrow, uh, Thursday, in case any colleagues have additional questions for you that they can direct your way. We'd appreciate your prompt response. Uh, but with that, the hearing is adjourned.